I'm so sorry that I can't be with you all today and have you watched this recording instead. For those of you who know me, know that I actually don't like preaching to a camera or teaching to a camera. But something came up and I cannot be in Waterdown this morning. I promise I'll be back next week in person. This week we continue our series in Disability and the Church. I call these series the Indispensables. Borrowing from the word of Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, in which he said the so-called weaker parts of the body are actually indispensable for the church. This week, we are going to look at one of those indispensable parts uh, of the church, uh, the, the Apostle Philip, who I think is the most understood apostle among the twelve. You see, the church decided uh, to or uh, chose to remember Philip in a rather interesting way. Of the 12 disciples of Jesus, you'll remember many things about Peter, or James, or John, or even Andrew. But Philip? Who's Philip, you may ask? What did he do that is memorable, or significant, or important in the Gospels? He was not in Jesus' Jesus's inner circle. He made no appearance uh, in the Synoptic Gospels. So you cannot find anything about Philip in Matthew, in Mark, or in Luke. But the early church also consider, considered um, him as important, or important enough, that he was included in the list of apostles. He's, if you look for the list uh, of apostles in the Gospel or in Acts, Philip comes always, the fifth. You can always find him in the fifth position of the list of disciples. And the only records of Philip that we can find are from the Gospel of John. The author of the fourth gospel is actually included Philip in four separate stories. And in these stories, Philip was remembered as somewhat atypical uh, as an apostle. He was, for the lack of a better term, a weak link among the twelve. Scholars and commentators never consider him, consider him as like a major character in the Gospel of John, even though he showed up in most of the critical points in the story. He was considered by many a side character, used mostly to advance the plot, to move the story forward. Some even consider him as the butt of a joke. So for most, he's considered as the least memorable disciple or apostle, or even the weakest disciple. So let's look at Philip and John. So these are the four uh, narratives or four stories that you will find Philip and John in the Gospel of John. Uh, you find him in the calling narratives, uh, where Jesus called very, uh, different people to be his disciples. Uh, and then you'll find him in the feeding of the multitude, or the 5,000s in chapter 6. Uh, Jesus asked him a question, so he gave an answer. And then in ch chapter 12, uh, a few Gentiles, the, the Greeks, uh, came to Philip and asked him to introduce them to Jesus. And finally, he asked a question in the upper room discourse, where Jesus spent uh, the final moments before um, he went on uh, uh, to be uh, to uh, to be arrested, and then uh, to get uh, before the the passion narrative, uh, you will find uh, Philip asking him a questions in the upper room. So these are the four stories. So let's spend some time to look at them uh, to look at them one by one. I believe we have already read uh, this uh, passage in the Gospel passages. Uh, so, and most of you know this story uh, as the conversation between Nathaniel and Philip, right? So, most of you, when you read these stories, most people would pay attention to the Nathaniel uh, ask. Nathaniel asked Philip at the end, "Is there anything good can come out of uh, Na uh, Nazareth?" And miss another point in this story. So, here you will see uh, the next day he decided to leave for Galilee, probably Andrew. And he found Philip, and Jesus said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I just want to point out one thing from this. And you notice that Philip, when he after he met Jesus, he was so excited about, about this, and he just ran to Nathanael, uh, without giving any context, uh, and said, "Oh, we found the one. We found the. We we found him. We found him." And Nathaniel seems to understand immediately who this person Philip is referring to, and continue the conversation with no need of clarifications. So, even though it's an uneventful kind of narrative, uh, this is rather this is a rather interesting thing that uh, that that we should 
pay attention to. So the next time we see Philip is in chapter 6. Here uh, it says, When Jesus looked up and saw a large, a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. John clearly says here that it is a test for Philip. A test to see how well Philip knows Jesus, or whether he believes Jesus is capable to provide to, provide to this large crowd. At this point in the story, Philip had already witnessed multiple miracles performed by Jesus. But even after seeing all the miracles that Jesus performed, he still cannot come up with a solution. It is like Jesus is standing right in front of him, but what he sees is not Jesus, but the problem, the problem of buying enough bread for these people. So the third time we see Philip was in chapter 12. Here it says, Now there were some Greeks, Gentiles, among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Philip was apparently perplexed by when he was approached by these Gentiles, which I imagine who kept asking him to let them to Jesus. Why they approached one of the disciples instead of going to Jesus directly is not stated in the text. Perhaps it was because they were still uncertain as to whether Jesus would receive Gentiles. Apparently, Philip also shares this hesitation. At the end, Andrew came to, came to rescue. Philip told him what's going on, and he initiates the inquiry to Jesus. And you know what? Andrew was also the person who came to, came to rescue, or to save the day, to come and save the day in chapter 6. After the conversation between Jesus and Philip in chapter 6, it was Andrew who brought the little kids with the bread and the fish, uh, and which Jesus turned that into a big meal and feed uh, the large crowd. Right? So this is the second time he saves the day. Uh, second time Andrew saves the day when Philip has, an, has, a, has, a, has a problem that he cannot solve. And then in chapter 14, where you have uh, a bunch of uh, questions and answers between Jesus and the disciples, this is how it goes. Jesus answers to some other uh, disciples, If you already know me, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do, know, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Well, to most scholars, the inclusion of Philip in this conversation has very little significance. Some argue that Philip's request of seeing the Father is simply to, um, to uh, a device to move the conversation forward, to advance the argument. And as always, Philip is considered as a character, as unimportant. So you see, Philip, it's clearly not your typical apostle. I always thought this, these stories painted a rather unflattering picture of Philip, a weakling among the twelve. I always thought the point of his story is to remind us that you don't need to be the best or brightest in order to be chosen or called to be a disciple. You don't need to be a straight A student to be counted as a good follower of Jesus. But it all changes t 10 years ago when William, my son, was diagnosed with high-functioning autism, or what used to be referred as Asperger's syndrome, uh, when he was four. Like, small par no, like most parents with special uh, need uh, kids, Irene and I spent the next several years getting our hands on every resource available to us to learn more about his condition. And the more I learned about Asperger's, the more I think the Apostle Philip may also be on the spectrum. But before I tell you my theory, let's talk about Asperger's, uh, Asperger's syndrome. Let me explain what it is. So if we want to talk about Asperger's syndrome, usually um, psychologists or, or people uh, who are familiar with the syndrome would talk about this in three uh, different dimensions, social reasoning, way of communication, and cognitive ability. 
In terms of social reasoning, uh, Asperger's kids, or as they call themselves, Aspie kids, uh, usually have a delay in social maturing or social maturity. Uh, they usually have trouble or have difficulty reading the situations or reading people, uh, reading people's facial gestures or reading um, uh, other gestures that people make that has nothing to do with words. Uh, often they will miss important social cues uh, or social reasoning has to be taught. Uh, they can find it overwhelming to be in a large social gathering where large amount uh, of social informations are there um, or many people talking at the same time uh, since it takes time for them to process aspects of a group conversation. So the delay of sometimes the delay of processing or responses may come across uh, to the conversation partner as being irrelevant uh, or having bad timing or too formal or even pedantic. So in terms of communications, they have uh, sometimes a tendency to give too much uh, information, too much details of a particular conversation topic. Uh, they will also start the conversation without providing enough general context for others to follow their ideas. Uh, so I remember when William was six or seven, uh, one morning when we uh, uh, go downstairs, uh, we were still living in the apartment building, go downstairs to, to the school, uh, to the bus stops to wait for the school bus. And he bumped into his buddies and he just ran to his buddy and said, it is so big, it is bigger than a house without giving any context. And obviously the other kid was like quite confused and just go uh, left the conversation and went to play with other kids. But as parents, we know actually what's going on because right before he left uh, the apartment and go downstairs, he actually read a book about whales, uh, about how big the size of a whale. And he was so impressed with the size of a whale, that sometimes a whale can be as big as like uh, like our apartment or a house. He was so impressed by that, he can't wait to tell his friends. So we just go there and then just burst out and say, oh, it is so big, bigger than a house. And even to this day, sometimes uh, he would just start a conversation by telling me uh, he's really into football, American football right now. He would start the conversation by just telling me that, do you know this quarterback or this particular players, which I've never heard of, uh, did this in this game. And I have to remind him that you need to give me a little bit more context before you tell me something uh, so that I can follow and or, or so that I can see what, what is the point that you're making. So the kids, uh, the Aspie kids or uh, people with Asperger's syndrome, uh, they sometimes also take words quite literal. Uh, they have trouble reading uh, between the lines and some of them uh, have trouble understanding idioms. I remember <laughs> the first time that uh, we used to phrase raining cats and dogs. I need to tell him that uh, it's not literally cats and dogs uh, coming down from the sky. It's, it means uh, heavy rain. In terms of cognitive ability, um, the, the people with Asperger's or, or high functioning autism usually are, uh, have some kind of, you'll hear people uh, uh, characterize them by having an obsession or high level of fixation uh, or, uh, with a particular topic often uh, have a really remarkable enthusiasm for their special interests that they may not realize or recognize other people do not say at the same level of enthusiasm. They will often come across as being nerdy or like a walking encyclopedia. I, rem I remember William went through a phase where he can name every single kind of, uh, every kind of dinosaurs that I've never heard of with words that has eight syllables. Um, and he's also really into Jeopardy uh, lately. And usually when the topic that uh, he's interested come up like 20th century history for some reason, uh, he can usually uh, answer all the questions uh, in, 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 in that category. So this is uh, I, someone with Asperger's syndrome. You may, you, have, you may already have met some uh, people with Asperger's syndrome in your life, but this is generally the behavioral traits that you'll find uh, for people with Asperger. So now, Let's go back to Philip. With that kind of understanding of uh, as, uh, what is an Asperger, a, pers a person with Asperger's syndrome, let's put on a lens and read the story again. In the first story, Philip went, as I said, Philip started a conversation without giving much context to Nathaniel, right? This is the remarkable enthusiasm for a special interest, right? And for him, this special interest or this topic is the messianic hope in the law and the prophets, right? It, this is something that he fixated on. And I'm sure he kept bringing it up in his conversations with Nathaniel. So that's why Nathaniel needs no explanation or clarifications. He just went to him and say, we found him. 
We found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophet also wrote. And Nathaniel just click and he just know what's going on. The second episode here, when confronted with the problem uh, of feeding the multitude, all of a sudden, what, what he sees, it's not uh, what Jesus is trying to do. Jesus was actually expecting an answer like, yes, Lord, you can actually provide. Yes, Lord, you can. But Philip almost, because of the, the, the way the question is formed, right? The question is not, do you think I can do this? But the question is, do you think, uh, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? And all of a sudden, buying enough bread takes over as the problem. So instead of reading between the lines and see what Jesus is getting at, he was fixated with the literal meaning of the questions. To him, it is literally about what is involved in purchasing enough bread for 5,000 people. He failed to read between the lines. And in the third episode here, so Philip clearly does not know how to read the situations. After living with Jesus for three years, mentoring under him for the whole time, he still does not know how to read Jesus. And finally, in the fourth episode here, once again, it is the literal meaning that gets in the way. It is what keeps him from understanding what Jesus is trying to say. The, the, the discussion of an unseen father and the abstract idea of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, and the discussion of a place where Jesus is going to prepare for them, it's apparently too much for him to process in such a short period of time with so many people asking questions in the same room. So if you look at Philip with the lens of Asperger's, all of a sudden, you're not looking at the weakest link of the apostle. He's not the weakest apostle. I think what John is trying to do here, after all, it's not to bet mouth Philip or to, to, to paint a picture, plain an unflattering picture of Philip. What he was trying to do may simply be telling the reader exactly what happened. And more importantly, I think the questions we need to ask today is, why did the church or the early church chose to remember him this way? Why did they allow the author of the fourth gospel to portray an apostle this way? That is, as someone who can read between the lines, who can read a room, who takes things too literal, who speaks without giving much context, why didn't they polish the description a bit? Why didn't they make him more like the other disciples, more like Peter, more like John, more like James? Over the years, as I said, many uh, there are many explanations for this. But I think if we read the story from the perspective of a believing community that embraces people with disabilities, a unique perspective is, uh, is presented. And it is one that I think would contribute to the discussion to the meaning of the inclusion of Philip in the Gospel of John. I think what we see here in John is a testimony of how a church or a believing community uh, in the early church relate to someone with a cognitive disability, not just in the sense of accommodating, but in the sense of accepting, embracing, and empowering this person and be, and, as being one of them. In fact, not just one of them, but an important figure, one that lists amount, uh, the greatest, arguably the most important community of the history of the church. He's one of the apostles. He's one of the 12 those that Jesus chose to be the first disciples. The early church community refused to see him as only a nerdy or socially awkward person. They did not treat him as somebody with an impairment or a, or a deficit. They didn't look down on him. They treated him as a friend. They learned how to communicate with him like what Nathaniel did. They mentor him, helping him to adapt to various non-autistic social situations and act, acted as the bridge between him and those that, that may not understand or appreciate his conduct, connect, condition, like the Gentiles in chapter 12, gently helping him to understand things that is not easy for him to understand. So you have Andrew there, always helping him, always saving the day. They gave him a chance to lead. They learned from him. They put him in position of power. In later church documents, the teachings and witness of Philip was considered as authentic and authoritative. He was considered by later church tradition as a leader of the church, and his teaching was used to authenticate later teaching about Jesus. 
I think the picture emerged in the stories of Philip here is one that embodies Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 12. It is a picture of the early church community embracing an autistic follower of Christ, treating him as equal, helping him to be a part of a community by being his friends, his colleagues, and his mentor. This is such a beautiful picture of inclusion and empowerment. And I think it is a perfect example for us how the church today can embody the principle of Paul's teaching, telling us what we should do today, how we should accept, embrace, and empower people that are considered by many as not typical or as awkward, how we can learn from those who have different cognitive abilities and different, way of different ways of communication. So this is the story of Philip. Thanks be to God.